Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. Today we have a manga review of chapter 931, Osoba Mask. And there really is nowhere else to start this particular review than right at the very end, with the revelation that Big Mom has a spot of amnesia. And just like Big Mom herself, this is absolutely massive. It seems to be causing a bit of controversy amongst the fans at the moment, and for the record, I do like this development and I will explain why. But first I would like to flag that other people do have very valid concerns, as using amnesia as a plot device is a very risky endeavour, because it can go very bad very quickly. However, even if it doesn't, amnesia is one of those things that just feels a bit too convenient in any narrative context it gets introduced to. Like it's just such an easy thing to do to go, ah, oh, well this character has amnesia now. So it writes us out of some potential issues we would have had otherwise. A great example would be Sabo actually. His whole amnesia thing was just far too convenient in my opinion. And it made Oda's writing feel uncharacteristically weak. Which once again is just my opinion, don't crucify me. But what is the difference here you ask? Well in the case of Sabo, amnesia was used as a magical band-aid to fix a problem with the plot. But in this case, amnesia is being used as a device of intrigue to further the plot. As well as show us a new side of this character. Well, maybe not completely new, but one more akin to Big Mom's flashback self. I've always thought of Charlotte Linlin as a very tragic figure, really, having been used by Mother Caramel and heavily corrupted by the influence of Stroyson. The idea that she could return to a state of relative purity intrigues me a lot, because it may also give us a chance to properly explore whatever demonic presence of hunger resides within her, and perhaps finally attain an answer as to why she is the way she is. With that said, the obvious result that most people are realizing, whether they are in favor of it or not, is that Big Mom could now potentially join the Ninja Pirate Mink Samurai Alliance, adding some incredible brute force, and it doesn't stop there either, because if Big Mom is still able to command her children, then that essentially adds the entirety of the Big Mom Pirates to the Alliance as well, which Kaido himself said would result in an all-out war. Of course, you know the thing about amnesia is that it sets up a clock, to the inevitable moment where the character regains their memory. And this stage very much has to happen, because in this case, amnesia is being used as a device to add complications, and as a result, it must have a resolution. Knowing One Piece, this will occur at an incredibly chaotic moment, ruining the plans of everyone in the immediate vicinity. But a resolution could also be formed through a fusion of Big Mom's old memories and her experiences whilst being an amnesiac. As much as she hated the Straw Hat Pirates, her time with them may give her new perspective and forever change her character. And this would mean that Big Mom no longer necessarily needs to be defeated because she may not pose a threat anymore, or it could even lead to further tragedy as this new persona gets beaten and possibly even killed during the events of the arc. Many, many options. And it also comes with other little bits of intrigue, such as the fact that it looks like Napoleon is also quite confused by what's happening here. Meaning that homies created from Big Mom's soul are potentially very much connected to her state of being. So of course there's also Prometheus who could be affected, but more interestingly Zeus as well, who is currently enslaved by Nami. But what's even more interesting than that is the fact that if Big Mom does temporarily join the Straw Hats, she could be dressed up in Wano attire and even given a funky Japanese code name like everyone else. Something like Olinlin, Sharo Kurasaki, or Big Mom Manosuke. Lots of potential fun to be had. Although with that said, my very favourite part of this entire thing so far is the final panel of the chapter, showcasing a look of pure terror from Chopper. Now we've seen some scared looking Chopper in the past, but this is a completely different beast. It's actually kind of a mix of confusion and terror. Either way, I love it. As a doctor, I imagine that Chopper will also have to uphold his oath and treat even Big Bum as a patient despite the fact that he did threaten to kill her in this chapter. So yeah, look, as much as amnesia does make me a bit nervous, I am completely on board with this and looking forward to seeing where it takes us. The next key point of interest is most definitely the activation of the raid suit, and I am pretty thrilled with the results. Last chapter, I had some speculation that Sanji's raid suit would turn out to be a joke from his brothers, but instead he looks bloody amazing. And I really love that his primary color scheme is black rather than yellow, which I think we were mostly leaning towards in the past, but the black is just really schmick and evocative of his classic suit. So despite the crazy superhero hero vibe, it's still very much Sanji. I also quite enjoyed Usopp and Frankie's reactions to the wonderfully drawn transformation sequence. Took me a second to remember, oh yeah, they weren't on Whole Cake Island, so they're not used to this kind of madness. I'd also be really surprised if this didn't intrigue Frankie into looking into crafting his own super suit. But of course, the special ability granted for Stealth Black is invisibility, which could not be more perfect for this particular situation. But it also let Sanji achieve his dream of one day eating the Suke Suke no Mi. And as happy as I am for the guy, this could result in some annoying sequences of him constantly trying to sneak into the women's baths and such. Although who knows, maybe it'll have the side effect of Nami and Robin both developing observation haki simply to 
counter it. That aside, like I said, I'm pretty happy for him because I think Sanji gets relegated to comic relief just a tiny bit too much in the series, so it's always great to see him get a bit of a win. Oh, and just before moving on, I've seen a fair few comments from people who aren't keen on these developments being like, uh, aren't the raid suits designed to complement the genetic modifications of the kids? And Sanji doesn't have any, so... Well, actually, this is another case where invisibility is simply perfect. That's exactly what Sanji was good at. He disappeared from the eyes of the world, and furthermore, his family absolutely do not want him associated with them, so this is definitely the way to go. Discussion has, of course, also come up in regards to a future fight against Shiryu now. A sort of battle of the invisible people, which, to be honest, sounds like the most boring thing to ever be portrayed in a purely visual medium. As for a fight that is actually happening, though, the raid suit does seem to have given Sanji some enhanced abilities dealing with page one, whose hybrid form was revealed this chapter, and it's pretty much what I would have expected, except for the giant page one tattoo across his chest. Although I actually do kind of prefer this to what we've seen of Drake's hybrid form, actually, potentially a controversial opinion there. But page one just looks completely ready to wreck face in a very brutal way, and I like that. I'm really keen to know more about this guy though, because at the moment he's just some random dinosaur dude. Like, I wonder if he was particularly infamous in the world prior to joining the Beast Pirates, like Drake was. At the moment, it doesn't look like Law knows much about him, and he's pretty in tune with the happenings of the One Piece world. What Law does know, however, is about the concept of raid suits. Too much about the raid suits, actually, because he's from North Blue, which was a great little connection. I really enjoyed the parts where Law stated that he disliked the Germa, and he's clearly quite a super fan of the comic. That was just great. It's kind of incredible just how infamous the Germa are, actually. I suppose a lot of that is thanks to the propaganda comic that was run in the World Economic Journal, and I really would love to see them and their full forces in proper action at some point, but that's getting away from the chapter. So after underestimating Sanji, page one gets a nice kick. Very satisfying to see, even though we don't technically see it. It's a great panel though, with Law, Frankie and Usopp running away while page one gets struck in the background. It's a really nice piece of visual impact, especially after seeing Sanji way up in the air. I do find it a bit unlikely that this is the end of page one though. I mean, it might be the end of whatever fight we get to see on screen, and maybe Hawkins and Drake will show up to find page one defeated, but it's probably not going to be from that kick. Although if it is, damn Sanji. Damn. In that sense though, Wano is starting to remind me a bit of Whole Cake Island. Like that entire arc up until the wedding day was very much about the Big Mom Pirates being slowly and sneakily taken out so as to weaken their overall forces by the final conflict. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Wano followed a similar format. Finally though, we have a bit of a catch up with Robin searching for what I assume is the road Poneglyph. However, she is caught by the Oniwa Banshu, a group you might be familiar with if you've read any other manga based in traditional Japan. They are essentially the secret agents of 17th and 18th century Japan. Kind of like their equivalent of Cypher Pole, I guess often acting for the sake of intelligence gathering and security. In this case, we've got some tight security. And their leader looks to have a dildo for a head. This may strike you as odd at first, but his design actually looks to be based off Fukurokuju, one of the seven lucky gods in Japanese mythology. Fukurokuju also happens to be his name, so yes, it's a clear reference. The rest of the Oniwa Banshu are a bit of a visual feast though. The giant panel where they all appear around Robin is kind of overwhelming at first because we have a lot of really cool designs to take in. Oda once again demonstrating that he can come up with compelling and unique characters with little to no effort whatsoever. At the moment, my favorite design is probably the guy on the far right of the big group panel, who looks like a really awesome mixture of Soga King, Gladius, and Enno, and for some reason, it looks like he's riding a catfish. <laughs> I mean, what more could I ask for? I'm sold. Give me more of that guy. I'm quite pleased that we received a sudden expansion of the Wano forces in general, though. Something tells me that these are the sort of guys who are very likely to become allies should Orochi fall. But just closing this portion out, it would seem that Robin isn't entirely screwed, and even though the only one Banshu have correctly deduced that she is an outsider, she's been given the chance to explain herself, so I very much look forward to seeing what she pulls out to get out of this one. But that pretty much does it for chapter 931. Absolutely solid piece of manga with great action, cool new characters, and a nice plot twist. A very nice trifecta of brilliance. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produces in general, then please do consider donating to the Grand Line Review Patreon, because the support of all of you amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. Also do check out my Teespring store if you're interested in shirts, hoodies, and other miscellaneous items, with the proceeds going directly to support the channel as well. And if you'd like to join the fun, then please do head over to my Discord server, where a wide array of shenaniganry takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your thoughts on chapter 931. This has been the Grand Line Review, and I'll see you next time.